Well, tonight's lecture is all about bricks, bricks and tiles, Roman bricks and tiles, in fact, as a central theme. And particularly their production at a place just to the south of here, which is called Mainty, parish of Mainty. Now, bricks and tiles were incredibly important in Roman times, um, and it turns out in much later times as well, because a lot of brick and tile has been reused in medieval buildings and in more recent buildings as well. Those who are, who are fans of the series of books, which is known as the Rivers of London, written by um, Ben Abramovich, will know that Roman tiles feature there quite widely too. And in particular, the one of the proponents in the story, who's a modern day wizard, goes round excavations at sites run by Mola in London and steals <laughs> Roman tiles out of the finds trays and takes them off to his lair. And then uses them. I don't want to make too much of a spoiler, but uses them in creating magic spells, which um, is what the book is all about. Well, I don't know whether we're going to have any magic spells tonight, but I think we might perhaps see a little bit of magic in general about tiles and about how they work. It's a great pleasure to introduce a Tucson who are going to speak to us tonight. First, Neil Holbrook, who's the CEO of Cotswold Archaeology and also an internationally recognized figure in Roman studies is going to kick off. And then Peter Worry, who is an expert in Roman tiles and Roman tile production, is going to take over and talk us through what's been going on down at Mainty. So Neil, over to you. This is the Mick Aston annual lecture named after Mick Aston, um, one of our old trustees of Cotswold Archaeology and, and of course a very famous figure from television. And that lovely photo, which actually I took um, in a pub garden in Withington in Gloucestershire some, some, some years ago, the Mill Inn, if any of you know that. Um, what's our challenge tonight? Well, my challenge, in a sense, is to be a bit of the warm up artist for the for the main the main meat of the talk, which Peter's going to give. And but really, I'm just going to try and explain how Mindy came to be for Cotswold Archaeology. And I guess I've set myself a bit of a challenge, which is how on earth do you make that stuff interesting? Um, is that, you know, I think it's quite interesting. Peter thinks it's very interesting, but what do you think? Um, and I guess it's a slightly sort of personal recollection in a way for myself of when I first came to Siren Sester a number of decades ago now. And I was, you know, interested in the Roman town. And what's, what's the first thing you do when you go to a new place where you try and read up about the place you're going to start working in and try and get to feel a bit of the history? And um, I read a book by Alan Weir quite early on when I first came to Gloucestershire. And in it, he, he, he wrote this little paragraph. Mindy, 10 kilometres south of Sirencester, was the main brickworks of the area one of the biggest civilian works yet found in Roman Britain. So that sounds quite exciting. Um, had they known? How did they know? Um, what's the evidence? Um, well, actually, it, it was kind of frustrating because um, there's Alan, by the way, and he did a, and there's it on, on right, it's his thesis. He, did, he actually became a, sort of did a thesis on, as you can say, brick and tile. So he knew what he was talking about, um, undoubtedly. And he was talking about um, he was talking about this place here, Mindy. For those of you who are not local on Zoom, there's Sirencester, the Roman town of Sirencester, and this is the top end of Swindon, that sort of Blunsden. And so here's Mindy, a little little village as I say, about six miles south of Sirencester. And it, it was a bit frustrating, actually, because you just couldn't really find out very much about it. Um, because when you delved a bit deeper, so much seemed to relate to an excavation undertaken in 1974 by a gentleman called Anthony Scammell. But no report had ever been produced. Um, so, indeed, Alan says, you know, in a, you know in, in a quote in his book, 
Much more will be learned when Mr. Scammell's report is available. Um, and so that was frustrating. It's a bit of a dead end. And so I, I have to say, I kind of sort of thought, okay, well, I'm not really going to get much further in my reading on all this. So um, I kind of parked my interest for a bit, I guess. And I, thought, and I thought, well, yeah, well, okay. So they made tiles, they made Roman tiles at Mindy. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, so what? Why is that interesting? You know, what's what's the interest here? I guess the angle I came at as an archaeologist interested in the Roman town of Sirencester was what did it tell us about the logistics and the organization of how the Roman authorities went about creating a, a new Roman town on a on a on a on a, on a largely virgin site. On the southern sides of the Cotswolds, um, you know, how did the industry work? Um, and also, perhaps, kind of more importantly to me, how and when did this occur? Because you might perhaps be surprised to to learn that actually, our knowledge of when the Roman town of Cyrencester was actually built is very sketchy indeed. But if you could date the tile works which perhaps was then creating the ceramic tiles that would go on the roofs of these brand new <laughs> buildings constructed in a Mediterranean tradition imported from, by the Romans into Britain. That would help to give you an idea of when the Roman town of Cyrencester was first created. Um, so that was the hope. But, you know, it was a bit of a dead end, as I say. But the obvious point to make is this is new technology coming into Britain with the Romans in AD 43. You know, there is no evidence of ceramic tile production occurring in the, in the Iron Age period before the Romans came to Britain. And indeed, the vast majority of people in Roman Britain would have continued to live in somewhere like this. You know, you might think that doesn't look very Roman, but actually that's 100% Roman in many ways. It's most people lived in rural farms with thatch or wooden roofs. And so tiles were kind of part of a package that went with a certain type of architecture. You often stone, sometimes, sometimes wood, but in a sense that that something that would have been sort of familiar or at least sort of familiar to people from the Mediterranean and especially from France perhaps a lot of the inspiration for the architecture of early Roman Britain came from France perhaps rather than from Italy but our challenge really then was around the fact that we knew so little about the origins of, of Roman Sirencester and I, I've just put on this slide a few thoughts that I, I had a couple of years ago um, about this topic. I mean, the first point to make is that Romans arrived in Britain in AD 43, and yet most public buildings seem to be no earlier than AD 100, so we're at least 60 years, perhaps, after the Romans first appeared. Also, from what very little traces we have, and I have to make the point that our knowledge of this is so slight because most of the archaeology that happens in Sirencester has occurred of the late Roman layers, because they're the ones literally you take off the topsoil and that's where you come down onto these Roman, late Roman townhouses. The early Roman deposits can be buried underneath four or five feet of accumulated Roman deposits, stratigraphy as we would call it, and hence the investigations of those deepest layers have been very, very tolerable. And that's why our knowledge is so weak. But extrapolating from a few things, it does, it seems to me that first century Sirencester was built to a somewhat different plan from the later Roman town. And perhaps that the population was very small indeed. And I, I suggest hundreds, maybe rather than thousands. So rather than a big bang, where a bit like say I don't know Milton Keynes or the, the, the builders arrive and construct a whole new town within a, within a decade. Um, Siren Sister doesn't seem to have that. It has a it has a sort of longer gestation. And one of the reasons for this might be to do with both shortage of funds, um, 
and also a lack of architects, masons and builders, because, you know, there was a, bo a building boom going on in Britain in the first century AD as the infrastructure of the, of the province was created. And perhaps literally, you know, you just couldn't lay your hands on these people. Um, very hard to lay your hands on the builder now. So, um, you know, could, could, could you do it in the Roman times? I don't know. So I guess my idea was of a slow drift of people from the countryside into the new town. But again, if you could date, if you're going about dating, it does matter. If you could date when these tile kilns were constructed, you might begin to get a handle on those questions. So I guess the point I'm making is that the, this reconstruction that you see in this museum, this is the classic sort of reconstruction of Roman Siren Sester. This is around about AD 3, 300, 350. In the first century AD, it didn't look anything at all like this. Much, much smaller and perhaps much less like a town, actually. And perhaps the, the actual structure of the Roman town only took place in the period, I don't know, 100 to 150 AD, <clears throat> something like that. So um, I guess that's where, where I got to. And I guess mindy and tile production kind of dropped out of my mind. Until a few things happened. I mean, one was that there was a sort of renewed interest in, in Roman tiles in the sort of round about 2000s, um, partly driven by the large numbers of tiles being dug up in London in, in the urban excavations that Tim mentioned in the introduction. And they, 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 there was a very industrious gentleman called Ian Betts who mm -hmm. studied, studied that material in London. And also Michael Fulford, who was excavating on a large scale at the Roman town of Silchester in Hampshire. And he was determined to extract every ounce of information from every type of artifact he found in his digs. So um, he, things did start to become a bit more interesting. There was a renewed emphasis, but I guess the major discovery, which you like, was this report. Um, and this was discovered by a lady called Sarah Machin, I believe, who was doing a PhD. And it was buried in the archives of Devizes Museum. And no one knew it existed. Um, so here was a report written by Anthony Stammel, who undertook that excavation at Mindy in 1974. But the report hasn't got a date on it, but it can't be any, early, it can't be any earlier than the late 1980s. So it's probably a good 10 to 15 years after the excavation finished. And um, once this became known, it was quite interesting um, because, you know, this report that Alan McWeir had, had, looked, had looked forward to seeing, I doubt he ever actually did see this report, which is sad in a way. Um, it was quite an illuminating report. Um, for us, first of all, it's important to make the point that, that Scammell was digging here, this area called, which we sort of call Oaksy Common. So the village of Oaksy is there, and there's the village of Mindy there. Um, and he found some interesting discoveries without doubt, but what's also perhaps as interesting is what he didn't find. Um, so first of all, the, the kind of received wisdom was that there was evidence for around 10 separate Roman tile kilns at, at Mighty Common. And that's what led Alan to talk about one of the largest industries, civilian industries in Britain. Um, but Scammell was quite clear that in fact there, were, there wasn't 10 kilns at all, um, two or three maybe. And the evidence for the, for the 10 kilns had perhaps come from people walking over the fields, picking up bits of tile um, in the early 70s, and perhaps dumps of waste tiles had been misinterpreted, spreads of waste tiles had been interpreted as, as extra tile kilns. So for a start, perhaps the industry wasn't quite as large at, at, at Mighty Common, um, Oaksy Common, as perhaps had been anticipated. Um, but here is his site plan. And as you can see, he did find some kilns here um, and some possible evidence of structures. 
and some potential clay pits here flanking the River Swilbrook um, that you can see here. Um, and but what didn't he find? Well, the big surprise from his report was that it had always been supposed that in his excavations, he'd found Roman tiles with stamped letters on them. And indeed, some publications uh, took that as rare. I think it was some sort of urban myth um, and no doubt promulgated in part by Anthony Scammell at the time, or perhaps a misunderstanding. Because what Scammell actually says in his report is, there must have been another kiln field in the vicinity of Siren City that produced the tiles with stamped letters, none of which were found in the excavation I undertook. So yeah, in some ways it's disappointing because what you think you know, you now find out that you don't know. Um, so, you know, I was interested in this report, in, in, in this discovery, this report, and it's a bit of sort of, you know, archive, archival discovery. And mind you then, sort of still stuck in the back of my mind until a couple of years ago, when a, a bit of amazing serendipity happened. Um, first of all, Cotswold Archaeology got a, a little grant to do a bit of archaeological research. Now, normally what we do is we dig where people are about to build new developments, houses or roads or whatever. It's very rare for us to actually choose where we're going to dig. Normally that decision is made because that's where development is going to take place. And so when we did get this little bit of funny, I thought, where, where could we go? Where could we go and do something? And I thought, I don't know, what about Mindy? What about Mindy? So I rang up the county archaeologist for Wiltshire, Melanie Pomeroy Kellinger, and I just said, you know, I'm kind of interested in it. You know, what do you think about trying to do some archaeology in, in Mindy? And she said, oh, you know, do you know, about 10 years ago, there was a gentleman called Peter Lavery who just moved into the area. And he gave me a, and he asked me to come out and look at look in his look look, look in his field because he thought he had a potential Roman tile kill. I said, "Oh yeah, up on Oaksy Common." Said, oh no, 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 not not Oaksy Common, somewhere completely separate. And I don't know, news to me. So she then sent me this extract from the Sites and Monuments record, and you see this word, possible Roman kiln. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Um. I said, well, where's this? Where is this? And she said, oh, it's at Brandia. So there's Oaksy Common, the site that Scammell dug at. And here's Brandia. So these are these squares about one kilometer. So it's about two kilometers distant. <laughs> oh, how, how interesting. So um, she said, oh, you know, um, he's a very nice chap. Give, give him a call. And I'm delighted that Peter's, Peter Lavery's in the audience tonight. Um, so I did give him a call. And I said, oh, yeah, I've heard that, you know, you might have a Roman tile kiln in your, on your land. I said, oh, yes, oh, yes. So uh, Peter Worry and I went and visited him. We visited the laveries and um, we, they, 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 they laid out these, these, oh, we found these? Oh, my goodness. That looks like Roman tiles. Um, and... Um, so I thought, ah, oh, this, this this is the place for us. Um, this is the place for us. Peter and his family were very enthusiastic about a bit of work. Um, so what we did is, in, in good archaeological fashion, I assembled a team from Cotswold Archaeology, and here it is. Here, there's Peter and his son Ollie, and um, you can see we've got Anthony Scammell's report on the table. But listen, we went and sat and had a nice cup of coffee in Peter's living room and said. Um, how about doing a dig? How about doing a little bit of a dig on your on your Roman tile kiln? And he said, "Yeah, fantastic, go for it." And so, from that, the the Brandius Farm Roman Tile Kiln project was born. And now to tell you about what we actually found and why it's interesting and what it what it means, I'll hand over to Peter Warren. Right. So I'm not I'm not actually going to immediately move into uh, uh, Brandius. I thought we should have a short introduction on Roman tiles. So what I'd like to do is to start off with what is the sort of workhorse of Roman tiles, which are things like this. And that is a tegula, it's a roof tile. Uh, um, it's the basic roof tile. And to give you an idea, 
it looks like that. Uh, um, and this weighs, so you know, six and a half kilograms. Sorry, I'm, I'm lying, seven and a half kilograms or 16 and a half pounds in old money. So these are fairly chunky items. Right. So you have so you have your basic building block, which is the tegula, and you have a semi-cylindrical uh, tile, which is called an imbra. And those two go together uh, to form the part of the roof. So you have uh, columns of the tegula, the flat tegula going up the roof, and you bridge the gap uh, between them with a uh, uh, an imbrex. So that produces you a roof that looks like that. So that's that's the basic thing. And that's what most of the tiles you get over here are. But we also get tiles in uh, um, hypercourse in villas. So here, this is a picture from uh, from Chadworth, and is oh good right, and uh, um, up here you can see some tile some some tiles that are going to go up the wall. And underneath, you can see tiles that are holding up the floor. So if we look at that in a little bit more detail. So these are the tiles that are going up the wall. And these are for heating the, heating the, the room. So you've got a heated wall in, 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 a, in, a, in a villa. And it's made up of tiles that look like that. Those are uh, flue tiles. They come in various sort of forms. But that's the basic standard box flue, flue tile. Uh, um, so we have those. And then if we have a look underneath, and this is a picture actually from Great Whitcomb, which is sort of below Birdlip. Uh, um, and that shows you the stacks of, of bricks called bizarres, if you really want to uh, get into the jargon, uh, um, that are holding up the roof. And there are different sizes of these things. So this is the basic size. Uh, then on top of them, this should be a foot square pedales, but for those who are very good site, we find that actually they've used an inverted tegula on them, uh, um, which is a bit of a cheat. We obviously ran out of proper tiles. And on top of that are even thicker tiles up here, which are the, are the main platform of the roof, which is two foot square Roman tiles. So th those are the main sorts of tiles that we're going to be talking about uh, um, in this talk. Uh, now, Neil has mentioned the, something about uh, um, stamped tiles and why we were interested in the original Oaksey Park mining, because there were stamps there, which are rare finds. But there's quite a lot of legendary stamped tiles, and they normally say something like LEG, II, AVG, which is the second legion Augusta. Uh, so we've got a, quite a lot of those you can find. But, uh, Private tiles, uh, uh, private stamp tiles are as rare as hen's teeth. And uh, um, I've got a, uh, a little chart here that tells us how many there are. So there's roughly a thousand stamped, non military stamp tiles have been found uh, in this country. About 200 of those uh, come from London, and they are stamped typically PPB. London, uh, which means stands for uh, uh, um, the Procurator of the Province of Britain uh, uh, in London. And uh, um, those are actually in relief, which is slightly different to the other tiles, which I'm going to talk about, which are in queues. So, so uh, technical term, if the, uh, uh, um, the letters are standing out, then they're in relief. And if the letters are impressed into the tile, then they're in queues. And this, this again, will be an important issue. Now, in Gloucester, so, 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 so 200 odd tiles in London, and then three quarters of the tiles of, the, of these precious stamp tiles are found in Gloucestershire. Mm -hmm. Gloucestershire represents, I don't know, 2%, 3% of Britain. <laughs> it's got 75% of the stamp tiles. Uh, um, so we're in a special area. And uh, um, uh, just under 500 of those are in Gloucester itself, or hail from Gloucester itself. And they all start off RPG, which is Res Publica Glevensium, or Res for RPG, uh, which basically means uh, uh, property of the, the um, 
uh, uh, Gloucester Town Council or product of the uh, Gloucester Town Council. Uh, um, they, they did those sorts of things in those days. Uh, and, uh, um, and some of them actually also had the names of the town councillors on. So these town councillors are obviously important people and they wanted to stick their names on the tiles. Uh, uh, and uh, Gloucester has the only set of these things in the whole of the Roman world. Uh, um, and it names the actual councillors who are responsible for the kiln at that time. And again, we'll come back to that. So there's quite posh tiles. Now, when we get to Sirencester, which is responsible, uh, fits into this green section, uh, yeah. um, where we've only got 310, but still an awful lot more than the rest of the country put together. Uh, um, uh, we have tiles that are stamped TPF and several variants of them. And, uh, the, and most of these are of this form. So they are TPF, TPFA, TPFB, TPFC, TPFP, don't ask me what happened to the intervening letters. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, um, and then another series, which I will talk about, called LHS. So uh, five different TPF type uh, um, letter forms. And for what it's worth, each of those letter forms has a number of different uh, um, styles, shapes, different dyes, but they just say TPF. So there are eight different forms of tiles that say TPF, for example. Uh, um, and uh, um, two thirds of these come from Sirencester, and a third of them are found outside of Sirencester. And we wanted to find out where they came from. And by that time, we know that they're not at Oaksey Park where, because Scammell says they weren't in his kiln. So where did they come from? Now, Peter Lavery's kiln, uh, a supposed kiln, we didn't know whether it was a kiln or not. Uh, um, he showed us his, the, the stuff he'd found. No stamped tiles. Uh, um, very disappointing. But we thought, nevertheless, we might just you know, have a little bit of a nosy. Uh, um, so we did some uh, um, geophys, uh, and um, uh, this is what the plot showed. Uh, um, and this is upside down, incidentally. It's not an accident, it's, it's, so it fits with the next slide. So North is at the bottom of this slide. But what we want to look at, have I still got a cursor? Oh, yeah, I saw it brief. Right, yeah. Is this area here? So you can see lots of sort of uh, darker and lighter patches here. This, this, this is an indication of burning in this area. And so this, is, this was our target to, to see if this was the kiln. And here is a picture of the, 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 in the same orientation of, of the, uh, that patch. And we dug three trenches, one here, one here, and one over here. Now, the one over here was, from our point of view, a bit of a dud. It was where they were probably puddling the clay, preparing the clay uh, to, to, to form the tiles. And so there's a lot of clay there and a few artifacts, but it wasn't very interesting. Over here was very interesting. And this is what it showed. And this is a tile kiln. And so over this is the sort of entrance to the tile kiln. This is the stoke hole. This is the, the, this is the, the uh, firing chamber up here. Uh, um, and it's, it's exactly the right sort of form of what we wanted to see. And it's also quite developed. Um, over here, there's quite a number of courses of tile. Uh, and I, I should say, this is very close to the surface, very close indeed to the surface. Uh, so most all the top of the kiln has gone. We've only got, uh, um, well, we've still got a lot. We've got nine courses of brick uh, uh, on this side of the, the kiln. And uh, um, what is quite nice, we've also got some tiles on the floor here as well. This is outside of the kiln, but they still actually put some tiles down to keep the area clean. Uh, um, so we have ourselves a, a very nice kiln. And if we look at this, we're back now looking into the stoke hole again, it was slightly expanded. And you might be able to see that 
Uh, um, this wall here seems to be detached from that, the rest of the stuff over the hair, and likewise on the other side. And it looks as if the, the, there's a second phase of, of the kiln. There's two phases. This is it's been relined at some uh, point. And this is what you might expect, actually, because it's very hot in there. And so uh, uh, um, they have to ch change the, um, uh, the tiles on occasions. Um, we also dug a hole here in this little area here to see how far down we needed to go to get the floor of the kiln. It's about 20 centimeters and there are two floors. Uh, so uh, um, uh, possibly one uh, uh, um, um, before the tile was relined and the other later on. And um, give you an idea what this might have looked like in real life. Here is a, um, uh, a, a, a reconstruction. We start on the right hand side. This is the stoke hole where we're going in. And then this is the floor of the, 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 the firing chamber. And the tiles would have been placed on the top of this. Uh, um, uh, uh, and notice that there are holes in the floor to allow the heat from, from the furnace underneath to come up and to, to, to cook the tiles. And uh, um, that, that um, if we move over to the left-hand side, uh, you can see that that floor was resting on uh, um, cross walls with uh, uh, obviously arches to allow the heat, the, the, the uh, um, fire to be pushed through but it rested on those sorts of cross walls. So that's the sort of basic form of a tile kiln. And what would it look like in practice? Well, we have a splendid artist at um, Cotswold who has drawn this picture. Uh, um, and this is based on the kiln that we uh, have excavated. And this was his impression of what it would look like. Uh, um, so it's quite a big beast uh, and We've got some very neatly stacked wood here. Uh, um, uh, I think that's a bit ambitious myself, but uh, uh, but notice that there is smoke coming out the back. There would have been vents in this. I think they would have probably been on the top, but uh, it would have made it difficult to get the um, to, to do the picture if you put the smoke on the top. And notice this little chap down here. He's peering in, trying to see what the sort of temperature is like in the in in the furnace. So he's looking to see what color the tiles are. Uh, um, are they glowing red? Are they glowing, glowing sort of white? You know, uh, uh, which is the only way you could tell the temperature in those days. So we're looking at to, to uh, uh, find out the, the, the temperature. We will come back to him in a moment. Um, how many tiles would this uh, have produced? Uh, uh, I reckon uh, this, the, the internals of this kiln are about four meters by four meters square. So it's a big kiln. That's an that's unusually large kiln. Most private kilns are much smaller. Tile, uh, a kiln that size probably do 4,000 tiles in a go. Uh, um, that's actually about 20 tons of load. Uh, um, and uh, um, so it would take a while. Normal sort of private kilns, you'd be able to fire them once every two weeks, a week to warm up, a week to, to, to cool down. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and obviously you've got to load and unload. Uh, um, the tile making season was dependent upon the weather. You, uh, um, before you fired your tiles, you needed to dry them. To, to dry them, you needed to leave them outside. It didn't need to be raining and it needed to be warm. So the tile making season runs from sometime in, in uh, April to sometime in September. And we actually have uh, I, I'm written records to demonstrate that. One is a tablet from Vinterlander saying that they're, they're sending the, um, uh, the troops down to the kiln, and that's dated mid April. And we have a tile with a bit of graffiti on it from uh, Silchester that has a date in September. So we know that they were making tiles in September. Uh, so that's the rough, so it's roughly four months. Uh, and potentially with a, a load of 4,000 tiles, you could make. Uh, in total, let's say if we're making just tegeli and imbrices, you can make 16,000 uh, tegeli and 16,000 imbrices. 16,000 of those would probably cover an area of around 40 square meters. That's a huge uh, uh, um, area. Uh, and um, uh, uh, in terms of logistics, uh, um, there, was, uh, there was a rule in, in, in um, Roman Britain across the empire 
about the, uh, the maximum weight of a, of a, a cart. Uh, um, and you could load a cart with what was the equivalent of 500 kilograms. So we'd have needed 320 carts to, to uh, shift the production of one year. If we were only operating for four months, uh, that would have been 20 carts leaving every week and 20 carts coming back every week, uh, um, which I suspect would have chewed up the roads given the, the, the so it's you know, interesting piece of logistics. So that's, that is our sort of primary kiln. And the second, uh, 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 sorry, primary trench, and our second trench, uh, interesting trench, is this one here. And this is the raking's pit. So they had to rake out the kiln after they fired it, and they rake it out, and they push the ash into this uh, 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 dump here. And uh, um, this dump is full of ash and tiles. And in fact, it's a complete treasure trove of tiles. This is the best stuff that we got out of the kiln. And you can see down here, the sort of tip angle, this, that's this in the section here, you can see the angle at which the, 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 the product was sort of falling into the, into the kiln. Uh, um, so, um, uh, and, and we're about two meters down here, uh, um, possibly slightly more, but I can't admit that because um, um, health and safety would mean that we couldn't have possibly been down there. Uh, um, but, um, uh, um, so I'm sure I'm wrong in that regard. So uh, um, uh, that, that's the, those are the, the pits. So what do we find? So first of all, we found these objects. Um, uh, and both of these come actually out of the black stuff, the, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the one with uh, uh, all the ash. And the one on the left is actually this piece here. And it's a bit of the floor and it's got uh, and it's got holes in. And so this, this is the floor with the heat coming up. So that's the floor of the kiln. And the other one, which is this piece here with a hole in it, is the man who's looking into the sun. Mm -hmm. This is the spy hole, uh, uh, um, or probably is the, the spy hole, which is quite a nice little object to have. So we found those, but we also found some proper tiles. And uh, in total, we found almost two tons, or, or we gathered together almost two tons of tiles. That is 6,000 fragments, most of which went through my hands, uh, um, and most of which his lavery carried away and uh, are now sitting in his garden, ready to be reconstructed into some new venture. Uh, um, and as you can see from the, the chart, 70% of the tiles were brick, 20% uh, um, were tegulae, uh, uh, um, and the rest were you know, very small numbers. Uh, the reason for the concentration of brick is that most of that probably was actually used in the construction of the kiln itself, rather than as product to go outside. Um, tegulae, 20%, probably also includes stuff that was retained uh, um, for construction, but there are nevertheless very few embrasses. Uh, relative to what we might have expected. And uh, um, we also, uh, uh, so give you an idea. So here are, here are some products with, um, these are tegulae, one unstamped, one stamped. Uh, um, uh, these are flue tiles that are actually not box flue tiles. The one on the left is a sort of a, a, a system called parietalis, which is a wall tile kept away from the, the uh, except, except for the channel behind it kept away from a sort of permanent wall by a spacer, and the heat goes up behind. And the one on the right is something called a half box flue tile. And we have three, so we have box flue tiles, half, half, half box flue tiles, and periotiles is all in production at the same time, as far as we can see. And they're all stamped with the same stamp, uh, um, uh, um, which is slightly odd that you would have three different systems uh, in manufacture at the same time. Uh, um, and we have similar instances on other sorts of tiles there. We also found, uh, uh, and, and the museum people love this, we found uh, <laughs> footprints. Uh, so uh, the dog owners amongst you will recognize the one on the left because it's got claws on. Uh, um, the one on the right is some sort of hoofed animal. I don't know what it is. 
uh, and we also found uh, um, a, a boot print, from, uh, a nail, a hobnailed boot print. Um, we didn't actually find very many of these, which is uh, um, uh, slightly unusual. It does suggest that when these tiles were put out to dry, which is when these impressions get put on, uh, it was enclosed, such animals generally could not get in there. Uh, um, and as we've said, we found some stamp tiles. But what was really gratifying is we got a message from the Rama, Romano Brits to say, and this is our, this is the very first one that we found, and it says, <laughs> hi. Uh, and lest you should doubt me, it says, hi. <laughs> Uh, um, I'll come back to that in a moment. But we did find uh, uh, a lot more. Uh, and so we got the full alphabet, TPF, TPFA, TPFB, TPFC, TPFB, and LHS. Uh, TPFA is the only one where we didn't actually find a complete impression. So I had to couple together with two separate bits of, of a TPF. Uh, um, uh, the, this sort of alphabet, there's only one other example in Britain of an ABCD, uh, um, which comes from Lincoln, uh, from the bathhouse in Lincoln, where they've got LVLA, LVLD, LVLE, and LVLF. Uh, um, so there's still a possibility that the E and F might turn up. Uh, um, right, and how many of these did we find? Well, we actually uh, um, dug out 38 different stamped tiles. Uh, um, uh, which compares with the 96 that have been found in Siren Sester. Uh, um, but of course, we've got another season coming up and we'll find a lot more. Uh, um, uh, and Peter might have found some in the, in, in the intervening time, for all I know. Uh, uh, um, so um, lots of interesting stamp tiles. Uh, um, one of the questions that's asked whenever you have tile stamping is, how, how frequently were the tiles stamped? Uh, um, and we can actually offer you an answer here because we've got 1.8 uh, tons of CBM. Uh, sorry, CBM is ceramic building material. Uh, um, uh, and um, uh, we have 36 stamps uh, uh, um, uh, that we've actually removed. There are two stamps still in the, in the structure, uh, which I've counted, but not here. So that's roughly 50 kilograms of stamp. And 50 kilograms of stamp, 50 kilograms equates to roughly 10 tiles. So we can say, you know, in this particular tile, one in 10 uh, of the tiles were stamped, uh, um, which is a useful thing to know. Uh, um, some uh, the legionaries tended to stamp all of the tiles that they made, uh, um, but they also used subcontractors who didn't stamp any of the tiles they made. So if you go to a legionary fortress, you will find that uh, you know, there are some stamped and there are some unstamped. We also know it's a metal tool because actually this stamp that uh, uh, product that I said said high, it actually doesn't say high. It's actually that way up, uh, as you can see in the picture, and it's an LHS stamp. And the, the bottom stroke of the L, which is this bit down here, is missing. So that that bit of uh, of, of the die has broken off. Uh, and you can see from this stamp on the app over here is that these on, on these ones were several bits of uh, of metal, and I think they are metal incidentally uh, um, that made up the 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 die itself. So you can see there's a bit there that's uh, um, is a join, and a bit there that's a join. Uh, um, so uh, um, uh, metal stamps with bits missing, and we see exactly the same thing in Gloucester. And then the other point to note here is this huge stylistic difference. So you've got the one on the left, which is an LHS, which is entirely rectilinear. Uh, um, there are no uh, serifs, the fancy bits on the end of the letters. It's, it, it's very different in style to the TPFP stamp here, which is which has got much more body and shape to it. And it has serifs on uh, all possible angles. Uh, um, and uh, all of the uh, Gloucester stamps have serifs, incidentally, uh, um, and all of the TPF stamps have serifs, but none of the LHS stamps have serifs, which, again, we will come back to. Um, before we I'll say what that means, 
Let me just have a look at the distributions. The, the green bit here is the distribution of where the uh, TPF uh, series stamps are found. So they're found in the green, originating from 90, mainly in, in Saren Sesta, but just in this area. There are, are a couple of outliers, but they're probably recycled material. All the Gloucester stamps are found in the pink area. There are no uh, 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 um, Gloucester stamps found in the green area, and there's no green stamps found in the pink area. There is a complete division between uh, um, the, the areas of, of, the, um, uh, of the Gloucester production and the uh, Saren Sesta production, or the Mitre production, I should say. So uh, this leads me to the question, was Brandius Saren Sesta's municipal kiln in the same way that uh, uh, um, there was a kiln in Gloucester that was the municipal kiln for Gloucester? Well, there are a lot of strong parallels. Uh, uh, um, the tiles are the, roughly the same date. I haven't explained why they're the same date, but take, take it from me, they are. They're very similar in style. They're in cues, they, uh, 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 um, they have serifs, and they're made with a metal tool. They have a tight distribution focused on the town. There's no overlap, despite the proximity of Sirencest to Gloucester. And possibly they have similar wording as well. So we've got raised public Glaventium, product of, 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 of the uh, Gloucester key on all uh, on, on Gloucester public works. And I'm proposing Pegularia Publica Fakerunt for uh, uh, um, the TPR, which would mean made at the public tile works. And obviously it's made at the public tile works for Siren Sets, but they didn't, they didn't even deign to put that in. Uh, um, and the other thing is that this kiln is large, uh, um, the Brandis kiln is large. It's not a private kiln, uh, um, so it's very likely to be a municipal kiln. How long was it operating? And from this, we can go to Gloucester to get some uh, uh, um, information for that. Uh, um, in Gloucester, the civic dyes have, with the uh, uh, council of stamps on, there are 14, uh, there's two types of councillor you get there. There's a duo viri, who is a chap who uh, uh, has lesser powers. And then every five years, uh, there's a more senior councillor called a quinquinales. And we found six different quinquinales dies in uh, um, Gloucester so far, which means there's a minimum of 26 years production, which is five times five plus one for those who, but, uh, but it could be a lot longer. And they have an RPG tie without any uh, um, um, named uh, um, councillors on it, and the 38 different ones of those, which might suggest if they are also annual, that there are at least 38 years this is running for. At Saren Sesta, we've got 25 different TPF dies because we've got different lettering and then we've got different styles within that lettering. So we've got at least 25 years. LHS is not, not so convincing. We might think Gloucester was running for 40 to 50 years after next season starts in July. We'll have enough to get, get us up closer to the 40 or 50 years. And um, so what do we now know uh, that we didn't know before? We know that Brandius is likely to be the sole source of the tiles, of these stamp tiles. Uh, um, we can be reasonably confident that the different letters do not equate to different kilns. So TPF was made in the same kiln as TPF A, as TPF B. Uh, um, we have need to qualify that. Uh, we do know that LHS is made in the same kiln as TPF because we have, have a lot of commonality there. Uh, um, but we also know this is separation in, ta in time. So most of the LHS, or nine out of 10 of the LHS tiles are found in the uh, uh, um, kiln structure uh, and, and not in the kiln, it's, uh, in the uh, uh, raking pit, and it's vice versa for the TPF. So there is some temporal uh, 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 separation of, of those tiles. Um, and uh, um, of course, we now know there are many more dyes than previously known, but, but sadly, as yet, probably no additions to the alphabet. So the implications. Council owned the kiln. I, I'm pretty confident of that. It was probably, uh, production was probably leased to a contractor for a fixed period. Success, successive lessors were recognized by A, B, C, and P. And probably the contractor was remunerated by using the excess capacity for his own production of LHS-type tiles. Why do I think that? 
um, there are actually contracts in existence. Uh, there is one uh, complete contract from a place called Oxyrhynchus, which is in Roman Egypt. Uh, I hope that's the right way to pronounce it. I'm sure some classical scholars will probably tell me I'm wrong, but I can tell you it stands for the city of a sharp-nosed fish. Uh, it's on the Nile. Uh, 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 and this is a contract, and uh, the deal is you've got a landowner, and he says to another chap, I want you to come and make the tiles for me, I'll buy the clay, uh, I'll buy the facilities, you will make me X hundred of these, uh, or X thousand of these, actually it's pots from the tiles, um, and I will allow you to use any surplus capacity for your own production. Uh, and that's the deal. And uh, um, I would suggest because the LHS uh, stamp is so different, and also the distribution of the LHS stamp is different, sort of all the other stuff uh, uh, tiles are concentrated around Sirencester, the LHS dies are found linearly up Ermine Street. Uh, um, in fact, as far uh, as Silchester at one end and Kenchester, which is Hereford, at the other end. So very different distributions, and so probably uh, very consistent with this sort of picture. So, objectives for the next season. Uh, um, complete the kiln, unpick the phasing, keep digging through the kiln rankings, but uh, uh, we've got a lot, lot further to go on, on that pit. Uh, um, uh, check for a second kiln uh, and a second rankings pit. Because we've got a different, uh, th th this fact that we've got TPF uh, uh, um, uh, stance in the rankings pit and uh, um, uh, different stance in the in in, uh, in the kiln itself. The kiln has got in the in the, the stance in the structure of the kiln that we've found so far are TPFB and TPF TPFP, uh, um, and those must be put in place before uh, the products were produced. And if if the rakings pit is uh, is storing the products from that particular kiln, it would suggest. But TPF and TPFA, which is what we're finding in the, in the rakings pit, came after TPFB and TPFP, which is uh, uh, um, defies alphabet anyhow. <laughs> so we do that, and we've got to, uh, uh, we need some robust dating evidence, which we haven't yet got. We need to unravel the sequence of the dyes. Where does LHS, LHS fit? We need more stamps and more products. Oh, and I forgot. I always, I, 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 didn't say investigate the pot kiln, which is one of Peter's targets. So it's on there, though, Peter. Uh, um, and if there's time, which there probably won't be, we'll explore ancillary buildings and structures. Thank you. We've got an opportunity to have a few questions. If um, Peter and Neil were able to come and join me up at the front here, um, the general plan is that if there's a question in the room, um, if, you, if you shout it out, I'll repeat it so that those online can hear it. Um, if you speak loudly, I think we'll all hear it in the room, that's no problem. And as you see, we've got some coming up on the screen as well. I did start noting a few questions down, Peter, as we're going along, and every time, about two minutes later, you answered it. <laughs> um, but I just start off by just saying, presumably the rakings pit is all about the wasters from the kiln and the broken pieces, which presumably couldn't be sold or couldn't be used. Um, so there is statistically a question of whether that's at all representative. Yes, I, they, they can't be representative. Uh, indeed, all the stuff we find is uh, uh, unrepresentative, or, and certainly is unrepresentative of the production that was coming out of the kiln, because most of the production was not wasters and will have gone off. So all we have is the residue, which is a, a pretty selected, you know, it, it, it's an arbitrary, and, uh, and uh, um, we do not know what proportion of, uh, it represents in the original. Yeah, okay, that's good. Now, um, anybody in the room start off? Goodness me, right at the very back to start with. That's you. Right no, behind you. Nicola. <laughs> Shout out. Oh, um, uh, my question was how would the tiles have been stacked? Okay, so the question is how, how, the, yes, how the tiles would be stacked in the kiln. Do we know anything about that? We don't actually know. Uh, um, but uh, I've, I, what I imagine they are, and this, this also reflects how they are done today when you have this sort of a product, is that they're stacked on end uh, uh, um, 
Uh, so, so you've got So you've got a whole series of them standing on their end, and then another row of them standing on their end, and another row of them standing on the end. And I suspect then on top of that, there would have been further rows of, of, of them, perhaps uh, at right angles, so they could they didn't fall through. So they've been stacked you know, as many as you can, because it's very expensive to, to uh, um, fire a kill. Yeah, that's good. Um, I do know from, from doing exactly this, you also need a series of what's called kiln furniture. Another question is whether you find the kiln furniture. We do. But we, we do, exactly. So it's a complicated old business. Now the gentleman in front. Um, from the artist's impression, you, you can't tell how they got the tiles out of the kiln. They were obviously on the floor, and then there's that door more along the so How did they get the tiles out? Okay, so the question is, how did they get, from looking at the artist's reconstruction, how did they get the tiles out of the kiln? They take off the roof. Uh, so, so, so uh, um, uh, you've got to get them in first of all, and to get them in, you haven't got the roof on. It has to, it has to be loaded that way, and then you build a, a, a turf and clay and wattle sort of structure around it. Uh, and you fire it, and then you take it all off again. And we found quite a lot of the the debris from that process. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's good. Okay, we're going to take a couple of questions from uh, those online now. Uh, so the first is actually from um, Graham Barton. Has the Scammell report been published since its discovery in Devizes Museum? I think it's one for you, Neil. Um, simple answer is no. Um, all of us have just worked off a, off a photocopy. It's probably, probably the most um, scanned photocopies I've ever known. Um, so no, it hasn't. I'm not sure ever, is there even a, like an original that anyone's ever seen? Or is it always just a photocopy? I, I think it's all the photocopies. I think it's all a, it's all a photocopy, but perhaps there's an opportunity for us uh, when we publish the results of, of, of the Brandius kiln to actually in, incorporate uh, um, that report. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's important and it should be published and the photographs deserve to be published. That's good. And a very quick one from an anonymous attendee. Are the Gloucester stamp tiles available anywhere to see? I think there's some on display, isn't there? Uh, yeah, yeah there, are, there is a selected set on display in the museum, uh, um, but that's a very small proportion of the number of um, uh, uh, tiles that um, are found. There. As I say, there's 475, uh, of which I, think I, I found might... half of them, didn't I? <laughs> 129 is your responsibility. <laughs> I'll check before I've seen it. So a quarter are down to the tip. <laughs> So yes, the answer is some in the museum, but um, I'm afraid most of them are stacked away in the boxes. Um, now, Mark of the Nolly says, I do recall TPLF as well. Is TPFP the first workshop primer? Question mark. Uh, TPLF is probably an earlier uh, um, stamped tile because it's um, it's in relief uh, rather than in, in Q. So, so it's got uh, uh, um, uh, letters that stand out rather than are cut into the tile. And that was how uh, um, Gloucester, uh, the, the Gloucester tiles started out. There were a couple of, of relief uh, um, Gloucester stamps, and then they moved to uh, uh, all in queues. And I suspect this uh, um, uh, TPLP one is similar. It has a different distribution to, to the TPFs. So it's definitely not part of the Brandy's kiln. Oh, it's a different fabric, as I remember. It. Yes, it's a different it, fabric. Yes. I think TPLF comes from a wholly different source entirely. In fact, it's a Elias clay rather than an Oxford clay. Not the technical answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, let me just scroll down a bit and see what else we've got here. Anybody else in the room like to ask a question? Which we... it's um, it's all... um, yeah, please. There would have been a lot of fuel used in all this firing. You know, do we know where it would have originated from? Was it a local source? And did they have to bring timber from Mars around? So the question is, where did the fuel come from? Did they have to bring timber from miles around? Well, uh, we don't know uh, because we haven't actually analysed any, any, any charcoal as yet. Uh, but it's, it's, it certainly would appear to be timber, uh, and that would be consistent with most kilns. There are some where, where, where it's believed they might have used coal, but um, only one or two. And it is probably just the, the wood that is locally available 
Uh, um, I think ash is a, a, a highly recommended species, but we don't know. Okay, that's good. Anyone else in the room, please? Um, yeah, thank you. Would the same process in stamping be found in Rome, say? So the question was, would the same process of stamping the tiles be found in Rome and, and perhaps other cities around the empire? Yes, is the answer. Uh, um, there's lots of stamps in, 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 in Rome and throughout Italy and throughout the empire. Uh, Britain was quite late into the game um, in, in, in terms of stamping these things. That's good. OK, uh, a very practical question. Um, are any kinds of tools found in your excavations or indeed found at the sites, the sort of tools they might have used to help make the bricks and the tiles? Yeah. We haven't found any at Brandeis. Uh, um, the only tool that I can think of um, was a, a tool for combing the, the, the tiles. So I, you may have noticed, and there's some examples over, over there, on flue tiles, they combed the tiles to, to provide a grip for plaster to go on it. So they, uh, uh, and uh, we have found, uh, well, actually we've had, we haven't found the comb, we found an impression of the comb. So, you, uh, so the comb got laid flat and it's left a complete impression of what it looked like. But we haven't actually got the comb itself, but, but we've got the evidence. Mm. And I rather suspect many of the tools would have been wooden. Yes. Anyway, yes, so absolutely. certainly the formers and that sort of thing uh, would normally be wooden. Um, maybe this is something that um, Neil can help us with a bit. Um, Pamela says, why no tiles found at Chedworth? Did they use stone? And we could expand that out to say, of course, do other villas around the Cotswolds have these tiles? Does Mighty supply tiles to some of the other places too? Um, well, the answer is there's, there's, there's plenty of tiles um, at Chedworth. Indeed, if you look in the go, in the, go into the displays now, you'll see the hypercourse tiles that Peter showed a, a photograph of. Um, but yes, in the late Roman period, there was a transition towards the much more regular use of stone slates rather than ceramic tiles. Um, and it was predominantly third and fourth century AD. So the later Roman buildings that much more commonly have sort of hexagonal stone slates. Um, the reason this may be to do with um, the, the economics or the, the costs of the fuel, just mentioned the fuel for, for the kilns. Um, but I guess the reason perhaps is not that many ceramic roof tiles um, at Chedworth is that the vast majority were thrown away by the Victorians. Um, because literally until relatively recently, most archaeologists just threw the tiles away as not particularly interesting, not worthy of, of much further study. The ones with letters on were always caught, caught the people's eye, but the, you know, the, the, the routine ceramic repertoire, less so. And I think perhaps what this is just an example now where archaeology is gone, where as technology, as interest develops, literally every facet of material culture from the past is susceptible to greater study, both scientific and visual. And the insights that you can get out of it are of a level which perhaps 50 years ago were utterly undreamt of. Okay. Yeah, jumping uh, um, I got into uh, uh, this tile business by looking at the spoil heap uh, at Silchester. And uh, um, so all of these tiles would be thrown away because there was no information in, in, uh, um, in, in ceramic building material. And I looked at it and thought there was. And that's what I wrote my thesis on. Uh, so it was, you know, it's it's in it's in recent memory. That's two thousand and five. <laughs> well, I, I can add to that that this is exactly the process that Alan McWhirr went through as well in nineteen seventy four. I think it was or seventy five when he was um, excavating in the centre of Sancestor, and it, there was literally, you know, lorry fulls of tiles coming out of the out of the excavations. And he said exactly that: Why don't we do something with it? And that's what spurred him to do his PhD and to convene an important conference that was held at Leicester. Uh, shortly afterwards. So all these things are kind of coming together and, and tiles have become a very important theme uh, to explore. Now, I think we're probably running out of time a little bit. Is there one final question from in the room? Anybody else want to ask one there? We can probably take one more um, from here, from Malcolm and Ollie. Are the different suffixes not more likely to represent different workshops, as with coinage, not different lists? 
if you have different workshops, uh, you presumably might have different kilns. Uh, so so um, it's possible, and, and, and it, it depends whether what you call a workshop. But the fact is that, uh, and I gave you the argument why I believe it's so, it's because this kiln is clearly a municipal kiln, and uh, um, uh, and you have a different set of letters. So uh, we have a very good example of what this is about in, in from uh, the, the contracts in Oxyrhynchus. Uh, um, it could be, but I think the more probable answer is it, it, it's, uh, um, uh, as, as I suggested, contractors. Great. Okay, well, that's a very useful point, I think, to um, draw this evening to a close. I'd like to start by asking us both online and in the room to thank our speakers for introducing us to a fascinating topic and one that's really um, whetted our appetite, I think. So thanks to both of you for that. I'd also like to thank the museum again for, for having us here. Um, absolutely wonderful to be here. And um, Kaz and Indy down here in the control room, uh, setting it all up. And I hope it came across for those of you um, on Zoom at home. OK, there's a little questionnaire for you on Zoom to help us make it even better next year. And if there's anybody in the room who'd like to make a comment, we'll find some bits of paper or mention it to, to one of us here. And we'll um, take that on board when we review tonight and think about how we're going to do it next time. So have a look at the exhibitions, have a look at the displays. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us online. And I um, hope we'll see you again next year for the Mick Aston Lecture 2024. Thanks for coming. <laughs>